Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Adam Jovic. And I'm Claudia Omani. Coming up in this week's episode... Could mini health checks be the answer to saving the NHS resources? Will also be able to ban petrol and diesel cars by 2035? And how can you protect your dog against viruses? <clears throat> After a draw in the first leg, Oxford United are set to clash with rivals Newcastle United in the fourth round of the FA Cup. Daniel Tiffin presents. Here at the Kassem Stadium, Oxford United are set to face the Premier League's Newcastle United in the fourth round of the FA Cup. The fans have been enjoying a solid campaign so far in the third tier of English football, where they sit just outside the playoff spots of promotion into the Championship League. While making the top six would be the priority for the U's, a victory over a Premier League team would be a big feather in the cap of the club and manager Carl Robertson, as well as making it one step closer to winning that FA Cup trophy. Oxford are going to win 3 uh, 1. Marcus Brown as well to score anytime. Yeah, I think they'll get the victory because we have Marcus Brown and he's a very good player. And we also have Cameron Brannigan, who's very good as well. And our whole team is solid. I reckon Oxford United can win the FA Cup. Their game is a football game, and uh, I think they're quite confident that Newcastle is, uh, Newcastle is uh, not that strong. We're a strong team. Um, we've got some really passionate players at the moment. Play a style of football that's of a high league, such yeah. as more passing rather than knock it over the top. One of their players was quite fast. He's getting behind the defence all the time, so we've got to stop him. So uh, if we can do that, I think we're going to win. So. I don't think they'll be up for it today, Newcastle. We beat them 3-0 here last time, so... We were here the last time they played Newcastle. We, we won 3-0 that day, so it'd be nice if we could do the same again. Oxford have had a decent record lately in the FA Cup as they have won six of their previous eight matches in the competition, having suffered just the one defeat in the process to the Giants' Manchester City. They've also been really hard to beat here at the Kassem Stadium in the FA Cup as they've suffered just one defeat in the last nine matches. This means that the Premier League Newcastle side might have to be at their best tonight if they want to defeat the U's. Daniel Tiffin, Brooks TV News. For a quicker way to treat patients, let's see what's been happening at a 10 plus square shopping centre. Free mini health checks to spot early warning signs of stroke, heart disease, diabetes and dementia. 20 minute health checks for the second year running as the National Health Service in Oxfordshire have teamed up with Tebler Square Shopping Centre. Reported by Oxford Mail, since 2013 more than 190,000 NHS health checks invitations have been sent out in Oxfordshire with 95,485 taking up the offer, meaning half have not attended. People are getting bigger, lifestyles are getting more sedentary, so people aren't as active, it's more of a culture of drinking, uh, all that kind of thing contributes to heart disease. So we're doing an event at Oxford United um, in April. We've done events in workplaces like BMW, we were there for five days doing this. We've done stagecoach buses. We do target workplaces where there are a high percentage of men so that we're kind of reaching the audience that won't normally come. During the test, the patient will be asked some lifestyle questions, such as smoking and alcohol intake history. They will also take blood pressure, height and weight measurements. Every person will be given a traffic light warning grade, red for danger, meaning a visit to the GP is strongly advised, amber for caution and green for all clear. We asked the public what they thought did health checks and surgery that the people who were cared for their health were coming but the people who didn't want to know and needed to come in never did. Yeah because not everybody can get to the doctors can they or have got time so it's a short fix I suppose yeah. Could this be the way to nurse Britain back to health? 
Sabrina Chapman for Brooks TV. We go to Cowley Marsh to see the council's new plans for a controlled parking zone. Oxfordshire County Council have proposed a new controlled parking zone in East Oxford. The area, dubbed as Cowley Marsh, would affect 21 roads which currently have unrestricted on-street parking. We spoke to Emma Liptrot from Oxfordshire County Council. Initially, when I began my career um, working in controlled parking zones and permit administration, the problem just gets bigger. So we implement a zone here and then the commuters go to that zone. So then the demand from the residents is that we um, protect them and their visitors. So then it just extends and extends and extends. So bringing in parking restrictions for your zone um, will free up the very limited highway space available to residents and their visitors. So the reason why Oxfordshire County Council are looking at introducing a control parking zone in the Cowley Marsh area is that back in November 2018, we undertook an informal consultation, which means we asked residents how they felt about a scheme, would they want a scheme, and 50% uh, of the residents came back in support of that. So with that number, what we have now done is decided to take it to what's called an, a, a formal consultation. And we're actually undertaking that formal con consultation as we speak. Um, uh, decisions will go to Cabinet on the 26th of March. All those in favour, all those not in favour will all be considered. And then we will uh, make a decision at that particular time. We spoke to residents from Cowley Marsh to find out what they thought of these new plans. Uh, I live on Belvedere Road and apparently they're bringing the new restrictions there. And I've got so many students parking, or not even students, just people park on the road. And it means that sometimes I can't even park on my road. I'm a fan of them. Uh, we're on Kenilworth Avenue here where I live. I'm a university student and I, I have my car here. It's free parking all, all the way along the streets and it means sometimes I don't have anywhere to park myself. So. For this road, for me, I think it's a good thing. Roads such as these, which currently boast free on-street parking, will soon look very different. Residents will have to apply through the council for a permit, which can set them back up to £60. On the plus side, however, journey times will be improved and congestion reduced. This is George Durston, Brooks TV News. Laser pens, a harmless tool or a blinding weapon? Freddie Turner has gone to investigate. This helicopter was flying to search for a stolen vehicle. Instead, it came under attack. A common tool used for teaching, playing with animals and presentations, now being used as a weapon. A weapon that can cause blindness, and in serious cases, a crash. I spoke to Tim Webb, a police helicopter pilot with first-hand experience. Laser attack is when someone shines a laser, whether that's high-powered or a child's toy, at an aircraft for their own amusement, really. So it has the potential, these lasers, to blind people, really. For example, the police helicopter is a solo pilot operation. So there's only one pilot with one set of controls. So if he gets lasered and loses the capacity to see, potentially endangering the aircraft. At the very least, you're going to stop them doing the job they're trying to do. The job they're trying to do might be to locate a missing person who's injured in a field or, or, or something like that. So there's implications on you're stopping them doing the job they're trying to do. Um, if it's a, an airliner or... Uh, going into Gatwick Heathrow, then the pilot's incapacitated. That's obviously very serious consequences, and there's, a, there's no telling how bad that could be. I'm here at Oxford City Airport, where a pilot, aged 21, suffered a laser burn to the eye. He's currently in the JR with his injuries. His condition is currently unknown. Last year, there were 775 laser attacks on light aircraft. This represents a 38% drop since 2016. London Heathrow is one of the most affected areas for pilots, representing over 10% of the attacks. It seems that attacks on aircraft are decreasing, however the threat still stands. Freddie Turner, reporting for Brooks TV News. Next up, we speak to Arthur Landman to find out about the zero emission zone in Oxford. The Oxford City Council has proposed to ban all petrol and diesel vehicles by the year 2035 and become the world's first zero emission zone. The zero emission zone aims to reduce Oxford's toxic air pollution levels, tackle the climate emergency and improve the health of those living and working in Oxford. This will not only affect the residents of Oxford, but the university, the schools, 
and other communities. We speak to Oxford Brooks Sustainability Transport Team for more information. But firstly, it will certainly make people think about how they travel. Um, it will make people seek alternatives. Um, from a health point of view, uh, if people are getting out of their cars and they're walking and they're cycling, in particular walking and cycling, um, they only feel better. I think it will definitely affect some people's um, will decide to leave because ultimately they'll think I can only drive here. Um, but but then on the other hand, of course, the uh, the climate emergency. Uh, you, you know the university's uh, goals and strategies is to reduce its its um, its car carbon emissions. So that will ultimately have a, have a, have a positive positive effect. So there's there's pros and cons on both sides of the coin really. Um, and I suppose it just depends on how reliant you are to to your car to how you would perceive this um, consultation. We talk to some of the local Oxford Brooks community to see what they think. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I mean, Oxford's such a small city and people use their cars quite unnecessarily at the moment, I think. So hopefully it will reduce that and maybe the cycle pass will be used more. Um, I think it would just be really annoying because that's how I get to uh, uni. And I didn't think I'd be able to get the bus because it's so long and traffic and everything. Uh, so I think it would be a great thing for the environment having no cars on the high street. But I don't know how to work with shop deliveries and also other routes around the city. Transport is responsible for nearly 30% of the EU's total CO2 emissions, of which 72% comes from road transportation. The proposal will introduce a charging scheme, and anyone caught driving a non-electric car within the zone will be fined. For more information, visit the Oxford City Council website. This is Arthur Lamman, Brooks TV News. Still to come... We see how floodlights could be the end of Woodstock Town Football Club. And we find out more on how to support your dog when they're under the weather. Hello and welcome back to Brooks TV News. I'm joined now by Moira Towler. Is that correct pronunciation? That's yeah? correct. Thank Lovely, you. cool. Yes. So we're just going to go over some questions about your background. I know you're a mm -hmm. scientific officer, if that's yes. correct. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions here just to um, go into your field a little bit. Could you just give us a background of your career in science in general, if you were to summarise it? Um, yes, I <laughs> did um, a degree in zoology at London University and um, with the aim of teaching initially. So I taught biology throughout, throughout the school at um, a girls' high school. And then after that, I got married and had children and I didn't want to go back to teaching. So I looked around for um, <coughs> a job in, with a scientific background in biological science. And I got a job at a Pollard's Wood Re Research Station which was very near where I lived in Charlpont and Giles. And then after two years, I went up to London, uh, um, worked at Chester Beatty. The research station was part of the Institute of Cancer Research. And I was there for the next um, 20 years, working my way up through, up to a scientific officer. You can't go any further without a mm. PhD, which I didn't have. Working in cell and molecular biology section doing basic research on cell cycle, cell signalling, um, yeah. Okay. What was it that drew you towards the, um, the biological aspect of science? Um, always interested in biology. I think I fancied myself as a David Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that was a very limited um, career path. Um, I didn't like the physical sciences, but I knew I wanted to do something in, in biological. Ooh, lovely, so. okay. Um, on the topic then, seeing as women only make up 50% of people working in the STEM industry uh, within those occupations, as a woman yourself, um, how would you experience or witness any kind of discrimination in the workplace or did you ever feel like that affected you as a woman? Not at all. Not in the biological okay. science. No, the, most of the scientific officers were women. Okay. I think perhaps if you're going to do physical science, physics or astronomy, <clears throat> that's much more a male field 
or, or it was anyway, I, I don't know now, but um, no, no discrimination at all. Okay, and yeah. why do you think it is, obviously with the statistic I've just stated there, do you think yeah. there is a reason that women are maybe avoiding these industries or um, steering away? I think they did. I, I can't speak for um, school children these days, but when I was at school, it was sort of a stereotype that men did science, maths, physical science, chemistry, women more on the biological side. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a genetic thing but women do seem to prefer the biological mm. sciences whether it's in in school you there's a fear of maths which you need for physics whether that puts girls off certainly put me off mm, yeah <laughs> but I, I don't i don't know why really i think maybe okay. just women are more uh, to this biological side. What would you suggest in terms of trying to get more women in the industry? Is there anything you'd advise or say to try and encourage people to uh, take these career paths? Well, I think it has to come from the teachers at school. And I th probably these days they're, they're more open-minded um, and girls are encouraged more now, aren't they, to do those, those um, subjects, especially technology. When I was at school, there was no technology really at all. And I, I think that if I had my time again, I'd be really interested in that. Okay, and just a couple of questions here to kind of um, mm. conclude the show. What would you say is the most exciting project that you've worked on yourself in your history? And do you have anything you're working on currently? Um, most exciting? Well, I think just working in cancer research itself is exciting because there's so much of it about one in two people now get cancer. So it's, it's really interesting to be in that field, mm. much more interesting than the, the job I went on to afterwards. Um, I'm actually retired now. Okay. Okay. So nothing so, at the moment. So really I'm not that. doing anything at the moment. Okay. No, but I still follow it and keep up with them um, with cancer research and visit okay. laboratories. Yeah, Things lovely. Like yes. Well, thank you so much for your time. That's all we've got time for for now. But uh, I really do appreciate you coming on. And thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely thank insight. Thank you for inviting there. me. Lovely, thank you. Thank you. Woodstock Town Football Club have been very successful in recent years. Our reporter, Kieran Ahern, visited their ground to take a look at the issues that they are stopping from progressing further. Town FC could be forced to close its doors as it faces an uncertain future. Unless they can secure a new location with a floodlit pitch, the club, which has been running for over a hundred years, may fold. Woodstock Town thought they could have their new home at a proposed housing estate in southeast Woodstock. Development had been supported by the local council, and Blenheim Estates even put forward plans for a site of 410 homes that included a new grass pitch with floodlights, a modern clubhouse, and a 3G astroturf. However, the council's decision not to include the site in local plans has raised questions about the club's future. I'm at Woodstock's current ground on New Road to speak to the chairman, Neil Roberts, about the impact this could have on the community. Floodlights here would have very little impact on the local community because they're only going to be on for an hour on a Saturday afternoon and possibly once a fortnight in the week. This year we've had terrific response from local businesses that have never been involved with the club before because they can see the importance of it. The, the club's invaluable to community because um, it's, it's virtually the only, the only sports club in the town and um, everything, the football is free, we don't charge everybody to play, we don't charge everybody to watch the game, um, and so it's absolutely vital. Equally, the Marlborough School has very poor sports facilities. There's no, there's no 3G, there's no floodlit facility, Hopefully, between us, we can come up with a, a decent enough venue to benefit ourselves, the school, and the town. The local council didn't support it twice. Um, it was supported once and recommended by West Oxfordshire. So at that time, we honestly thought that that was, that was it. But the vote went against, and so we're back to square one. The FA will make more regulations, not less. They're never going to take the, the stipulation that you must have floodlights in this league. They're, they're going to add extra things. They're, they'll say you want 100 seats, then there'll be 200 seats. So it goes on and on and on. They keep stepping up. And as I said before, to share this with the school would be perfect for Woodstock and, and the local community Woodstock because it hasn't got anything like that. The 
town needs more sporting facilities, not less. Let's take this away, you know, from everybody in Woodstock. It can be a, a big loss to the town. Woodstock Town FC are currently third place in the Hellenic Football Division 2 North. However, they have taken two voluntary relegations in the last few years as their ground is not up to the standard set by the FA. Let's hope it's not full time for this historic club. Kieran Ahern, reporting for Brooks TV News. <clears throat> the HPV vaccine can now be given to boys in the UK, but there is still not enough information about it, as our reporter Helen Morton finds out. The human papillomas virus, or HPV for short, was originally created for girls to protect them against cervical cancer in 2008. But, in September 2019, the Department of Health decided to routinely give it to boys also. This means that boys can now be fully protected from developing the severe cancers such as cancer of the anus, cancer of the penis, head and throat cancer, and also genital warts. In terms of the girls, because um, my daughter goes to a girls' school, they have been great. Um, they, she's had her jabs, it's all come through the school, we've had all the information from the health service and the consent forms and everything, and it's all happened in school. But in terms of Patrick and from the boys' school, I've never heard anything at all. So perhaps if he was younger, I'm assuming they maybe are doing it lower down school, but for him, we've never heard anything from the school at all. Obviously, some people don't get vaccines from their own choice, so if it's in school, generally people will get it. Um, as for how people found out about it, I just found out about it through being told. Um, but yeah, I, th I definitely think it should be promoted more, talked about more, and advertised more and things like that as well. There is still not enough information out there or easily accessible to help parents and children to know what they are being given and also how they are protected against these forms of cancers. Schools need to make their pupils more aware of what the vaccine is and that it could actually save their life. But, sadly, a letter is given to the parent and then it is sprung upon the child. Helen Morton, Brooks, TV News. That's what I'll ask you. Have you had the flu vaccine? I have, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I know they're offering it on campus yeah, now, yeah. yeah. There has been a rise of gastroenteritis in dogs across the UK with local cases in Oxfordshire. We report to Alexa Everett to tell us more. There is an unusually high number of cases of gastroenteritis being seen in dogs across the UK. The virus has spread into Oxfordshire with local cases in Banbury, Bicester and Didcot. The cause of gastroenteritis is mostly unknown. Symptoms include vomiting, diarrhoea, tummy pain and loss of appetite. We asked dog owners in Oxford what they are doing to protect their dogs. I found that um, if I followed the vet's instructions, uh, in virtually every single case, the problem's been cleared up. So all I know is that uh, when a dog has an upset tummy, then it's important to feed them really bland food and food that has uh, soluble fibre in it. We've got a special paw washer because evidently they can pick things up on their paws. At home support for gastroenteritis is being recommended to dog owners. We spoke to Katie Noble, veterinary physiotherapist, to find out more. There's a lot of things that people can do at home um, just to help their dogs out a little bit when they're feeling under the weather. Um, something like keeping their water and their food close to their bed so they haven't got to get up and go too far. Um, it's within easy distance. Putting things like a hot water bottle uh, and soft blankets in their bed as well can just help reduce stif stiffness if they're, you know, when they do get up and move around. It just helps keep them warm and comfortable. So there's a lot of things that people can do. The Blue Cross have recommended to keep your dog up to date on vaccinations to reduce the risk of contracting the virus. If you think your dog may have gastroenteritis, be sure to contact a vet immediately. Alexa Everard, Brooks TV News. That's it for this episode, so thank you from us and the rest of the crew for watching. We'll be back again next week, but remember, you can watch all of our previous episodes, plus extra bits and bobs, on the Oxford Brooks YouTube channel. Yes, and please don't hesitate to get in touch with us by emailing brookstv at brooks.ac.uk as we'd love to hear from you if you've got a new story you think we should be covering. See you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>